When I heard the Canadian government banned the ownership of assault weapons a few weeks ago, my first thought was, good, guns are bad. I could have left it at that and forgot about guns for another few years, but people were blowing up my Facebook about it, so I decided to take a closer look. And I was surprised to see some pretty interesting and frankly enlightening views from the pro-gun camp. So what were they so up in arms about? <laughs> Let's take a look. Hi! You're watching Gabby on Government. I'm Gabby and I'm an ordinary Canadian on a journey to learn about my government. I'm so happy you're joining me on today's journey where I'll be discussing Canada's recent gun ban. If your Facebook page looks anything like mine, a few weeks ago you saw pro-gun folks say, guns are not the problem, mental health is the problem. If you're gonna ban guns, you should also ban cars. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. These new laws only serve to restrict the rights of law-abiding gun owners. And the anti-gun people came back with, no one should have a handgun or an assault weapon, period. What do you need that for? You don't need an AR-15 to bring down a deer. These regulations are long overdue. Any firearms ban is a good firearms ban. And I guess that's the interesting question here. Is any firearms ban a good firearms ban? In this case, the answer is much more complicated than I thought. If you're watching this from the US, you may be thinking, aren't guns already banned in Canada? No, nope, we have guns. You may also be surprised to learn that we have a military. But in Canada, guns aren't used for personal protection. In Canada, guns pretty much only have two purposes, hunting and recreational shooting in controlled areas like shooting ranges. After the Ecole Polytechnique massacre in 1989, our modern firearms laws were introduced, uh, largely outlined in the Firearms Act. These laws make owning a gun in Canada onerous, and nearly all Canadians agree that this is rightly so. A friend of mine recently went through the process, and I was pretty impressed at the scrutiny he went through. He had to take a course, write an exam, apply for his license, which required a reference check, mental health history, and background checks, and getting approval from his wife. Now that he's licensed, he gets virtual criminal record checks every day, has to keep his guns unloaded, locked in a special lock box with another lock on the gun itself. Buying and transporting guns is also strictly regulated. Vox did a really good video on gun ownership in Canada called Armed and Reasonable if you want to learn more. I think in the context of deciding whether or not you agree with this gun ban, it's really important to remember that Canada's gun laws and our relationship with guns is way different than the US. So you may say, okay, well sure, most legal gun owners are responsible because Canada has robust systems in place. But what about the shooting since the Echo Polytechnique massacre, the Quebec City mosque shooting, or of course the attacks in Nova Scotia that sparked this recent gun ban? These are terrible tragedies and the reason I personally have no interest in guns. That said, would the ban enacted have stopped these from happening? This is where things start to get confusing. So the government banned any gun that was used in a mass shooting, included in a list of about 1500 military style weapons that were banned. When you hear that, you would logically think that any semi-automatic weapon has been included in the ban. But this isn't the case. Both pro and anti-gun critics have pointed out that many semi-automatic weapons, nearly identical to many in the ban, are still allowed. I know this sounds strange, and in all my reading I haven't been able to find a good reason why so many were missed on this list. It also doesn't touch on handguns whatsoever, which account for the majority of homicides in Canada. That's to say nothing about the weapons that flow into Canada illegally from the US, and guns that are illegally resold within Canada. It seems like this ban was haphazard at best. Okay, okay, you might say, so these new regulations aren't perfect, but at least it's a start. At least there was some movement on banning these types of weapons. But now we have to ask ourselves, at what cost do these regulations come into play? This might seem like a strange question to ask, but it's really at the heart of this issue. You see, if the government wants to add, remove, or change a law, it needs to go through Parliament where it goes through a rigorous process to be passed. This is one of the foundations of Canadian democracy. As Canadians, we believe that the rules that govern us should be debated and thoughtfully contemplated by our elected representatives. 
The point being, this gun ban didn't go through parliament, which until now I didn't even know was possible. Instead, it was introduced via a regulation change. Regulations are written to implement the specifics of a particular law. But while laws can be added and changed through parliament, regulations can be changed through something called an order in council, which comes down to a cabinet decision, no parliamentary scrutiny needed. To a lot of Canadians who were paying attention to the specifics of how this gun ban was implemented, this was seen as a gross overstep. They say that this regulation change was so substantial that it should have gone through Parliament as a new or amended law. Orders in Council are legitimate decision-making tools which allowed the government to be more efficient, but as it states in the book Democratic Government in Canada, excessive use of Orders in Council, like in this situation, constitutes a very serious disregard of the position and value of Parliament. Using an order in council to prescribe such an impactful change, especially during a pandemic when people's attention is elsewhere and parliament isn't in session, has been described as many as an erosion of our trust in democracy. The next step of this ban will be a bill that has to go through parliament, and the bill will dictate the gun buyback program the government has promised. So when it comes to the gun ban, there are really two different questions at play. Should these guns have been banned, and were they banned in the correct manner? Even if you think yes, these guns definitely should have been banned, I think you can still say no to were they banned in the correct manner, because it was enacted in a way that overstepped and eroded our trust in our government. Despite all of these arguments, I still think some people could reasonably applaud the government's actions. Think of an unpopular measure you think would be really important for the government to adopt. Even if it wasn't pushed through totally transparently, you would probably still be high-fiving any leader who was willing to stick their neck out and thinking how it takes courage and willingness to be unpopular to do the right thing. While I see this perspective, I'm just perplexed why the ban was implemented with so many holes. I think of a lot of Canadians, especially gun owners, really feel like their trust has been violated with this move. Why would Trudeau not just put through comprehensive measures? Stick around until the very end of this video and I'll share my own conspiracy theory as to why Trudeau enacted this ban with such vigor. So what do you think? Do you think even with all the issues this regulation change has that it's still justified? Do you think this change should have gone through parliament? Are you planning on fighting for your right to keep your AR-15? Did I totally miss something here? Have I been brainwashed by the gun lobby? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm not a civics or gun expert, so if I got something wrong or you want to add something, let me know in the comments. I think learning about civics is super important, so if you want to help other people find my content, I would be so grateful if you would like this video, subscribe, and check out some of my other videos. Oh, I almost forgot my conspiracy theory. In 2015, when Trudeau was crowned Prime Minister of Canada, he was the handsome, thick-haired, new kid on the block. Everyone loved him. We were on our honeymoon with our new man. But life as a Prime Minister has been tough on Trudeau. He's had to make some big boy decisions and break some promises. And the world's spotlight has slowly moved away from the golden boy. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, a young pup named Jacinda was elected as Prime Minister of New Zealand. With long brunette hair and cunning good looks, she won the hearts and minds of people around the world after her swift leadership in banning semi-automatic weapons after New Zealand's own mass shooting. Theirs was passed through Parliament, I might add. Only days before our own weapons ban, Jacinda was named the most popular politician in the world. Trudeau brooded. Not to be outdone, he did the only thing he knew how to do. Try to steal the spotlight and haphazardly push through the new regulations. Take me back, Vogue! That's my theory and I'm sticking to it. Thanks again and see you next time.